WrestleMania 3, you can argue, is when WrestleMania truly became WrestleMania. It's the earliest incarnation of the event that was a precursor to what we know as WrestleMania in present day. And the first WrestleMania event to be held in a stadium where the attendance is stuff of legend. WWE has long boasted that the attendance amassed some 93,000 people. Wrestling historians dispute the attendance as inflated by about 20,000 people, more or less. Still, for the time, and even to this time, over 70,000 people gathering for a wrestling show is no easy feat, especially in 1987. A lot of promotions had stadium shows over the years, and none of them looked quite like the spectacle that was WrestleMania 3. So let's go ahead and jump into it Pro Wrestling Planet style. Before we get started, make sure you are subbed and all that. We would very much appreciate it. WrestleMania 3, as mentioned, was the most ambitious WrestleMania up until that point. Vince McMahon presented this one-of-a-kind stadium show as a way to really drive home that he had not only brought wrestling to a nationwide peak, but that he could also do what many had wanted to do and that was absolutely jam-pack a large stadium. To do this, Vinnie Mac needed a huge main event, and while WWE tries to historically point to it as the first ever encounter between Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant, it was indeed not. But let's look past that for the purpose of this video and just relish in the fact that McMahon was able to take this huge match and sell it in a different way to his nationwide audience. Yes, what we can say about Hogan versus Andre besides that hasn't already been said. Arguably, this is the biggest milestone in the history of WrestleMania, at least up until that time. And Hogan versus Andre, bigger, better, more. It was the 80s and the height of modern wrestling up until that point. Andre had been a babyface pretty much the whole time of his WWF's national expansion. So his heel turn on Hogan during Piper's Pit was a huge angle and really helped drive home the match. Now, like I mentioned, there is a lot of legends surrounding this show and inherently this match as well. Hulk Hogan has told the story for years that, quote, I wasn't sure going into that night that Andre would lose, brother. Others have refuted this. Either way, this match was seen as a passing of the torch and the first of its kind in WrestleMania history. The Hogan-Andre main event was perhaps the blueprint for a sports entertainment main event. The match will forever be compared to the other big match on the card, the Intercontinental Championship match between Randy Savage and Ricky Steamboat. This match actually went the longest on the card, clocking in at 14.35 while Hogan versus Andre had a time of just 12 minutes and one second. This match was without question to me the best quote-unquote wrestling match to take place at WrestleMania up until this point. Most fans will agree with this statement. Very few will attempt to argue it. If you can think of a better one from Mania 1 or 2, please let me know down in the comments. So this match has almost as big of a legend as the main event itself, and as said, with good reason. Steamboat claims that the match was laid out in great detail, perhaps more so than most matches at that time, or even ever. The layout of the match was a Randy Savage trademark, as many throughout the years have made mention of this strategy. Steamboat also goes on to say in interviews that he and Savage had a number assigned for each spot or move, and allegedly Savage would even call Steamboat and randomly quiz him on these numbers. If anything, the stories cement the fact that Randy knew that this match was big, and indeed it was. In between those two matches were a couple of quick forgettable ones, as Honky Tonk Man defeated Jake Roberts. Jake Roberts had a very sickly looking Alice Cooper in his corner for the match. Also, the Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov defeated the Killer Bees in a five minute DQ. Butch Reed defeated Coco Beware. 
There was a six-man tag match where Danny Davis and the Hart Foundation took on the Bulldogs and Tito Santana. This was perhaps the 80s equivalent of trying to get everybody onto the card, including a Dynamite Kid who barely participated due to injury. These matches were all just kind of there, and the Hearts and the Bulldogs would of course go on to be players while Butch Reed not so much, and hey, Coco Beware is a WWE Hall of Famer, so there you go. Roddy Piper was pushed down to the mid card here to work with Adrian Adonis, and Piper was getting ready to hit Hollywood, and you have to think that this had a lot to do with his positioning here. Piper had already taken some time off to film projects prior to this and was returned to TV as a babyface to take on the Iron Adonis, who had started hosting his own interview segment that was thought to have been the replacement for Piper's pit. And Piper would be seen later that year in They Live and Hell Comes to Frogtown. And one has to wonder what history would have been like had Piper not started dabbling in Hollywood. Greg Valentine and Brutus Briefcake, or the Dream Team, if you will, defeated the Rougeau brothers in a quick four-minute match. Harley Race defeated the Junkyard Dog in just over four minutes. These two feuded as an after-effect of the King of the Ring tournament, which was won by Race, making him King Harley Race. And in a fun little comedy match, Hillbilly Jim, Haiti Kid, and Little Beaver defeated King Kong Bundy, Little Tokyo, and Lord Littlebrook. How the Mighty had fallen here as King Kong Bundy had headlined WrestleMania 2 against Hulk Hogan. And here he struggles to get a lower card spot as part of a comedy match. The logic here, I guess, being that since there was already one David versus Goliath type match on the card, they would make Bundy's match a bit different as to make it not seem so repetitious. Hercules and Billy Jack Haynes had a full Nelson challenge match as the two were feuding over the use of the move. These are the kind of storylines that I miss about the 80s and early 90s wrestling to be honest. This match ended in a no contest as most angles like this usually do. Finally, our opening match at WrestleMania 3 was a tag team match featuring the Can-Am connection of Rick Martel and Tom Zink going over Bob Orton and Magnificent Morocco. Orton, of course, was just kind of hanging out around this point. And Morocco would stick around a few more years, but Rick Martel would have an interesting WWF run that had a lot of unseen potential. Tom Zink didn't last too much longer and had his best run in WCW years later as the Z-Man. Overall, the show, it was all said and done regardless of the disputed attendance. It crushed gate records for the company. The pay-per-view is estimated at around 400,000 buys with an additional 400,000 or so reportedly tuning in on closed circuit TV, which was still a thing at this time. And of course, that would make it the most successful WrestleMania event up until that point. It was the height of an era, and Hulkamania was running wild, WrestleMania was running wild, and the roller coaster ascended to the top. And little did Vince McMahon know that a steep drop was rapidly approaching. So that's it, folks. That's the story of WrestleMania 3. Please let me know in the comments about your memories of this show if you watched it live or if you watched it years later. Please make sure you are subscribed to the channel if you're not already. Thank you very much for watching. Until we see you next time on Pro Wrestling Planet. Uh, yo! Yo! Yo, it's your boy JTG, a.k.a. J the God, one half of the illest tag team ever, Crime Time, and you are watching Pro Wrestling Planet, and we all know Pro Wrestling Planet is about that money, money, yeah, yeah, that money, money, yeah, yeah, cheer!